Well, I'm as all of your audience probably can already tell I'm Jewish. Greetings of peace. My next guest, Max Blumenthal. Declare that he's fighting human animals in Gaza as Israel cuts off the gas, the water, and the electricity. You know, I went to Hebrew school during the 1980s. Long live Israel. God bless America. You guys out here to support Israel? Yep. The radical Muslim must be defeated unless we're going to all ruin the whole Western civilization. Because Israel is for Jews since the beginning of the Bible. That's number one. Number two, the Arabs have no right to be there. They are forcing us to kill their children to defend our children. Yes. How much do we have to bomb them before there's peace? And no matter how long they must be bombed. Yeah. How many schools do we have to blow up before there's peace? Well, we, we have advanced technology. Israel knows what schools Hamas is hiding in. Correct. And then they blow up the whole school. They, they very intelligent. Yes. They're, they're hiding in They're making bombs under the desks. Exactly. Those who are dying are suffering God's wrath, but, but. We don't I seem like a good Jew? You don't seem like a good Jew, but who am I to judge? The editor-in-chief of The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, is an award-winning journalist and the author of several books. Max has contributed to The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and much more. Now, being the award-winning journalist that he is, he's debunked much of the atrocity propaganda that we still keep hearing over and over again that's fueling the continued push for a modern genocide in 4K right before our very eyes. All human life is precious, and this needs to stop. So, for example, I'm going to go ahead and play this clip from our friend Piers Morgan, and let's uh, listen to this, and then we'll bring on Max Blumenthal to go ahead and cover this. No Do you have proof that they targeted women and children, civilians yes. specifically? What's oh, the proof? I'll tell you the proof. What's the proof? You the, oh, the GoPro videos. Oh, you don't think it happened? Oh, the GoPro videos. So also, like the doctor, you no, deny... No, 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 no. no. You I've deny seen the videos. The, I'm a journalist. Happened. I've authenticated the videos. Right. I've seen the videos. Right. But show me the proof ah. that women and children were specifically targeted as opposed to... They were literally a, burned alive in homes. To, okay, where's the proof? People were beheaded. Proof. Get, Babies get, were killed. Name me one child. One child was beheaded. Name me one child that was beheaded. And I will mourn and condemn with you. I just said people Name me were one beheaded. Child. I didn't no. say a child. No primary source right? subject. No, no. no. So what, just to be clear, no primary source just to be clear, like the doctor, you do not believe that anyone was beheaded, that children were killed? Let me clarify where I'm wrong here. Were, were these things happening? Israeli civilians were killed. How many? I don't know. Mark Regev doesn't even know. Mm. We need to first establish... No, they do know. How many... We know at least 1,200 people, Israeli including citizens? around 400... Uh, soldiers. So uh, we're assuming 800 civilians okay. were killed, and we know at least how many of them were killed by at Israel? least another 200 odd civilians were taken hostage. How many right? Of them were killed by Israel. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Max Blumenthal. How are you doing, Max? Good. Good to see you. Good to have you on. <clears throat> Interesting intro. I, I forgot I'd written for the New York Times and was allowed to do that once upon a time. Yeah. So you have an extensive <laughs> history. Uh, you're doing what uh, journalism should be all about: uh, sp spreading the truth and highlighting the truth but you've also debunked a lot of things that uh, many people are seeing it's not the truth and uh there's an example with uh, Piers morgan what was your reaction to that well just because pierce morgan doesn't know something doesn't mean that it's not true and that's the way he operates he has this kind of a tendency to impose his own prejudices onto reality and then to use his image as a sort of objective newsman to make his guests seem like lunatics and his guests when he tries to make them seem lunatics they often happen to be activists or muslims or people out of the mainstream um, so they just don't appear objective to his audience it's all a series of sort of psychological tricks he's using and um, was that Dilly Hussein who was his guest? Yes. Do you know Dilly? Yeah. I, I Honestly, he could have done a better job. He could have been more clinical um, in, po in providing concrete examples of Israel killing its own citizens and citing Israeli media. And that's sort of what, but I mean, it's, a, it's an important for, it's important for him to raise that issue in front of a mainstream audience, but that's what I've been doing at the gray zone and what other independent outlets have been doing is just giving people who have this sense that 
what happened on October 7th is not only shrouded in mystery, but represents a series of distortions that were used and deployed in order to create political space for this un, this just un, this despicable genocide that we see playing out before our eyes. And so what we're doing is we're providing, you know, it's you, you have a, a sandwich of skepticism. You have the breads laid out and we're providing the deli meats for you, uh, translating the Hebrew news pieces, news packages, where they're actually, for the first time this week, showing tanks, shelling Israeli homes in Kibbutz Berry, where over 100 Israeli non-combatants were killed. They're showing the tanks in those communities during the day, shelling those homes. Um, we've also been able to uh, provide tr translations of Israeli eyewitnesses who witnessed Israeli tanks after it grew dark. So a separate tank shelling a civilian home, knowing that that home was filled with 15 Israeli hostages, including two children who were 12 years old, twins, the Hetzroni twins who were killed by that Israeli tank, who've been used as poster children by the Israeli leadership uh, as examples of you know, Hamas savagery. And that's not to say that Hamas militants didn't kill civilians on October 7th. That, there's, there's video documenting that. But we don't know how many people is Israel killed, and the number seems to be very high, uh, considering the heavy weapons they were using. Mm -hmm. How did you, what led you down this path of journalism? Uh, because you have many journalists, they're not even, as I understand correctly, they're not even allowed to go into without escorts. Is that correct me if I'm ever wrong here? Uh, they're not allowed. They need an. Uh, a company with the um, IDF and how did you, and, and then you go against the narrative and you put your career on the line. How did you, you talking about, uh, how did I get into Gaza? No, how did you just uh, start reporting on Gaza? Like, so before this happened, you were actually um, reporting on this and you were on the ground. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm as all of your audience probably can already tell I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, one of your partners also, who helped make the film Killing Gaza, I interviewed him. He's also Jewish. That's very interesting. Yeah. I had no idea you were Jewish also. Wow. Well, there are plenty of us who, wow. you know, are disgusted, who are disgusted by- Dan Cohen. It was Dan Cohen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, he grew up in a much more um, all, all immersive Jewish experience than I did. But, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C. And, I, um, you know, I went to Hebrew school during the 1980s and 90s and- you know, the first intifada broke out around that time. I wasn't heavily indoctrinated into Zionism, but I wound up going on the Birthright Israel trip later in life when I was like 22. And that's a free trip that all Jews 18 to 25 get to go to Israel. And that really showed me um, not only what uh, the, 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 the propaganda version of Israel that was presented to me, what they wanted me to believe about Israel, but the complete contrast between the the worldview of Israelis and mine. Um, you know, I remember my guide sitting me down because I had made some sort of humanistic statements and the second intifada was about to break out. And she said, we have to see all different groups uh, and religions and races as circles, and we have to take our circle and put it above all those other circles. And it was sort of like opening it. It sort of began this process of of gradual black pilling and red pilling. First of all, I'm never going to be able to be a Zionist, which means I'm going to be cut off from much of my community, and I'm going to be woken up to, you know, what the, the reality the reality that Palestinians are living in. I'd never met a Palestinian by that point, and then I got into journalism because of the post 9 11 era, um, just seeing the lies that. Americans were consuming constantly as the so-called war on terror was declared and then the invasion of Iraq. Um, these uh, were obviously going to lead the U.S. and the region into a terrible abyss. And so I started doing journalism just about the Bush administration and about the Christian right and the neoconservatives. And all along I was you know, following the situation in Israel, Palestine, waiting for the day when I could actually make my move 
and start to educate Americans about the real Israel they didn't know. That came after my first book, which happened to just sort of be a bestseller, which was more about the, the Republican Party of George W. Bush. And I said, I said to my publisher, I said, I just gave you a bestseller. You didn't expect that at all. How about you give me uh, the opportunity to write a book about Israel? And they agreed miraculously. And I said, okay, I'm going to take a trip there, scope things out. I took a trip, went to you know Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, the West Bank. This was 2009. I started covering the unarmed struggle in the West Bank where Palestinians in villages that were cut off by the apartheid wall were beginning uh, this sort of popular struggle that wasn't being covered in the West that cut against the grain of the image of Palestinians as suicide bombers and terrorists. And they're simply defending their land, being arrested in their beds. I got to know Israeli society. I remember the night of Obama's speech in Cairo, um, his sort of speech to the Arab world, which should now be looked back, at, looked back at as sort of a moment of infamy. I went out on the streets of Jerusalem to ask um, Jewish Israelis and Jewish Americans what they thought of the speech. And each one of them unleashed this genocidal tirade right on camera. And I found all these bars where drunken Jewish Americans were coming out and just telling me how they wanted to assassinate Obama um, and how Netanyahu was going to take care of him and how Israel was going to take care of him if he uh, pushed ahead with peace with the Palestinians. And they said he's a Muslim and all, the, all of that. I put that video out on YouTube. Um, it was like, you know, one of, I mean, I, I was already doing all these viral YouTube videos about uh, the Christian right or Christian Zionist. So I had a fairly strong channel. And within two hours, it had 500,000 views. It was blowing up. Um, Black America was seeing the video and they were disgusted. It was reported on local New York news because a lot of these kids were from Long Island. And then the next thing I know, YouTube took the, takes the video offline. It was censored on every channel. I was like one of the first victims of the censorship industrial complex for exposing the racism of Israeli society. But that kind of set the stage for the book that I was going to do, which was called Goliath, which really, if you, if you pick up my book, Goliath, Life and Loathing in Greater Israel, which came out in 2013, it will really show you the, help you understand the basis for how Israelis are so indoctrinated that they can cut off hundreds of lives with the push of a button, knowing that they're going to kill dozens of babies with one bombing and feel good about themselves the next day. The, the, the book is a, a trip into, it's a journey into the heart of Jewish Israeli society. And I use my privilege as an American Jew, you know, I'm treated with special privilege in Israeli society um, to be able to get access to that. And I, I subsequently did another book called The 51 Day War, which is about Israel's assault on Gaza in 2014. And I got um, press access from the Israeli government to be able to go in then. And at that point, you didn't need to be like embedded with the Israeli military. They weren't even there at the, that point. They were just bombing from the air through drones and so on. They just handed me a card and said, go ahead. Um, they were handing them out like, like candy at that point. So I got to be under the bombing uh, that people in Gaza experience day after day. And I got to be in the rubble. And, you know, I started filming that documentary you mentioned uh, with Dan Cohen, Killing Gaza, which is free online. And I've been covering Israel-Palestine ever since. At the gray zone, what we do is we unpack the propaganda that deluges uh, Western media consumers day after day, pro-war propaganda, pro-interventionist propaganda, and we help people understand the other side. And we also go to countries that are targets of Western regime change operations, mm -hmm. including in Latin America. Like we've done a lot in Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, places where the U.S. does not want these countries to be independent and have access to their own resources. And with October 7th, it pulled me back in to Israel, Palestine, back into this maelstrom in a much more intense way than I've ever experienced. Like uh, all Western journalists, I can't go to Gaza. I don't even know if Israel will let me in at this point because I've kind of been marked. Um, so I'm just sitting here at home in Washington, D.C., unpacking the propaganda and helping uh, people understand how they're basically being tricked into supporting a genocide. Let's get into this next clip. And you're probably going to recognize this uh, individual. And he's talking about some video that 
the general public hasn't seen. We've seen some of it, but this is like some private private session for journalists. I want to see if you know or if you've seen this video. Like I said, today's been a heavy day um, <laughs> because uh, three of us went to the Israeli consulate to watch some of the footage uh, that we've never seen. These images and um, media, a lot of it raw, some of it, um, they did some editing too to identify things of what happened in the massacre on October 7th. It's 47 minutes long. Now, some of it I have seen before, and you can find it online. A lot more than I expected was new to me. I realized something that I had missed before, okay? It took me immediately and deeply into a past trauma. The exact feeling that I had when I learned why 9-11 happened. Charred reminders of a Holocaust the obvious desire to see as many Jews utterly destroyed as possible. Families melted together on purpose. And yes, there are women, dead, bloody groins, twisted, disfigured legs. The IDF says this is not a morbid coincidence, it's a part of a pattern of rape and torture. Well, right. before uh, we even started, uh, you you, um, you had a little reaction. You're from you're from well, you're familiar. Um, I mean, the last part he's described. You're the last part you're, he's, you're familiar with Cuomo. Yeah, Chris Cuomo. Chris I'm very familiar with. He was fired by CNN, and he's on this uh, network of like the has beens who've all been fired. Um, with Bill O'Reilly, he was fired because he was helping his brother Andrew Cuomo write, uh, you know, prepare messaging during the COVID event uh, when Andrew Cuomo was like getting an Emmy award for his daily press conferences. Mm -hmm. And it was all this giant performance and he was promoting his brother. It was complete nepotism. Cuomo was also one of the like thickest, mentally thickest people on the, on the air. And there's a lot of competition there. Um, if you look at his Instagram, all he does is lift weights. He, you don't see him reading books or engaging with uh, intelligent people in any way. It's just him f showcasing his muscles and showing off in the gym where he spends like four hours a day. And you can see that he was an easy dupe for the Israeli government. Uh, they brought him into a 47 minute screening. They've been bringing in so-called journalists to an off the record so-called screening where you're not allowed to really disclose the details of what you see. You're only allowed to refer on background generally to what you see. You're not really allowed to ask questions as a journalist, and you're not allowed to videotape or take photos of the proceedings. So why would any journalist allow themselves into that kind of clockwork orange pro style propaganda complex if they're a real journalist? They wouldn't. Um, and what Chris Cuomo is describing at the end is seeing uh, the remnants of corpses who were hit by Hellfire missiles by Israeli helicopters on their way from southern Israel to Gaza or just simply while um, being in their cars in Israel. Some of them may have even been trying to escape from the Nova Electronic Music Festival. It is a confirmed fact that Israeli Apache helicopters killed many people in their vehicles and while walking on the fields. This is, this is not this is not some conspiracy theory or something. This is confirmed fact. I mean, that it's the, confirmed uh, by an Israeli police investigation, which was reported in Haaretz. It's confirmed by wow. uh, f abductees who had been freed from Gaza, Israeli abductees who complained about Israeli Apache helicopters shooting at their vehicles while they were heading into Gaza. They complained to Netanyahu's face during a war cabinet meeting. Earlier this month, it was reported in the Israeli newspaper Ynet. Uh, we have video of the helicopters hitting cars, and we have testimony by the helicopter pilots about how they couldn't determine who was Israeli or Palestinian on the ground, but they had to, in their words, empty the tank of their ammunition. They had absolutely no intelligence. Um, and it, if you look at the images, for example, from the highway of death from the first Iraq war, when the U.S. Air Force incinerated a large part of the Iraqi military as it retreated from um, Kuwait, which was a, a war crime. Um, you'll see this; they look the corpses and the cars look almost identical 
to those in the so-called Gaza envelope of southern Israel on October 7th. There's no way that the weapons that Hamas militants brought in could have done that kind of uh, comprehensive damage to bodies where they're melted into parts of cars that a Hellfire missile can do. And in one case, I mean, this is going to sound kind of rabbit hole, but this is something I was able to figure out. I actually had to take it out of one of my articles because it was just, uh, there, there's too many details. But you might be familiar with the story of how um, this so-called Israeli rescuer named Eli Beer went to a Republican Jewish coalition fundraiser in Las Vegas and claimed that his rescue group on October 7th found a baby baked in an oven. This story really got around. Totally fake. Um, the organization itself has even sort of retracted that story when they were asked by the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. It comes from someone in his organization who said that they found body parts that had been uh, melted into a heating element, you know, the kind of heating element you'd have in an oven. And they found those body parts at this kind of um, military base slash field hospital Israel set up um, in an Israeli city called Ramle, where they analyzed all of the evidence and corpses of October 7th. Okay, the heating element was actually a car seat that has springs in it that are shaped like a heating element. And somebody was hit by a Hellfire missile, which led their skin to melt into the car seat. And then it, the, that piece of body part was taken to this Israeli field hospital where they basically saw it and said, oh my God, this looks like someone was baked in an oven. Let's just say that to invoke the Holocaust. Wow. So Chris Cuomo is just being treated to these images and they're telling him, they may be even guiding him through it. He has the IQ of a toaster oven himself <laughs> and he's incapable of critical thought or skepticism. And so he then says, this is 9-11, this was genocide. And he actually thinks that the U.S. response to 9-11 was successful and positive. The U.S. response to 9-11 was, a, first of all, a military failure. Does he remember the U.S. retreated from Afghanistan and lost to the Taliban in one of the most disastrous military withdrawals since Vietnam? Has he forgotten that? Has he forgotten the entire military response was a failure and that the only successful possibility was a police action against Osama bin Laden at Tora Bora, which itself failed. So everything Chris Cuomo is saying there is false. And this is what the American media consumers are being treated to, which is why there was a poll, I think taken by Harvard last week, which found that the majority of Americans think Hamas is determined to commit genocide. And only about 35% think Israel has the intention of doing that. Let's get into this next uh, clip here. Get your reaction to um, this. Used to defeat them, used to kill them. And one thing I saw is that whether you live in the north or the south of Israel, whether you're religious or secular, everyone agreed and united. We can no longer embrace this being Mr. Nice Guy to the people who are in Gaza because this is over a thousand years of mothers teaching their children, grow up and kill Jews, grow up and That's kill right. Jews. It's the mindset. They're trying to paint this narrative that uh, Muslims just intrinsically they're, intrinsically, they're taught, you know, to hate Jews. Um, I have a, a lot of uh, Jewish friends that I've had on the program. You might know some Orthodox rabbis. I don't know if you've know, heard of Miko Pillid, um, yeah, Rabbi I mean, Weiss, Rabbi I mean, Shapiro, I mean. and and they differentiate clearly Zionism uh, between Zionism and uh, Judaism. And they say that uh, Judaism has been hijacked by Zionism. And now they're trying to paint this picture to the, to the mainstream audience. And she's repeating the same thing, that this is uh, their survival. They're going to be killed by Muslims if they don't um, go ahead if they put down if, if they stop what, what do you hear as a jewish man when you hear this well a thousand years ago jews and muslims were getting along fairly well and uh you know uh, maimonides was corresponding with ibn rushd uh in in the andalusian experience it wasn't anything like the european experience but michelle bachman um someone who uh you know is in Chris Cuomo, maybe below Chris Cuomo's intelligence quotient, um, 
believes that Palestinian mothers have been raising their children to hate Jews for a thousand years. Uh, she doesn't even, I guess, remember the Christian Crusades where um, Jews and Muslims actually resisted the Christian onslaught in Jerusalem. She knows nothing about history. She's at Charlie Kirk's conference, his recent conference, um, which is sort of conservative, conservatism incorporated. It's basically corporate conservatism. And she went on to deliver a tirade there calling for everyone in Gaza to be ethnically cleansed, full on ethnic cleansing and to turn Gaza into um, some kind of nature reserve. One second, let me let the audience hear, hear that. Because they have one industry in Gaza and that's terrorism. So it's time that Gaza ends. The two million people who live there, they are clever assassins. They need to be removed from that land. That land needs to be turned into a national park. And since they're the voluntary mercenaries for Iran, they need to be dropped on the doorstep of Iran. Let Iran deal with those people. Is that she's pretty much saying to two million people, I mean, half of which are children, uh, that they need to be removed, needs to be made a national part. How do you interpret that? Yeah, I mean, she's calling for genocide. And the irony is she has been appointed as dean. This is a former member of Congress from Minnesota who is a very prominent member of the Christian right. Um, and she has been appointed as dean of Pat Robertson's Regent University. Pat Robertson being one of the most prominent televangelists in American history and con artists and believers in uh, Christian Zionism, the belief that, you know, the Messiah will descend onto Jerusalem after uh, all of the Jews are gathered in the land of Israel and the unclean her heretical Muslims and Christians are removed because um, they actually don't believe Palestinian Christians are really Christian because they're not born again in the blood of Christ. They're Orthodox Christian. Mm -hmm. So Michelle Bachman comes from that mold. She's been appointed the dean of a university in America, and she is explicitly calling for genocide in public. And you have all of these campus presidents at the same time from the Ivy Leagues being hauled before Congress, who have never said anything in favor of genocide, being asked to condemn hypothetical calls for genocide that have never happened on their campuses. And one from my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, has already lost her job as a result of her kind of wishy-washy answer about a hypothetical call for genocide that never happened. Uh, Harvard's president is next. She's on the chopping block. So that's fine. She can call for genocide. There's because, because uh, uh, it's genocide against Palestinians and you know, there's more to it. Charlie Kirk poses as an America first conservative conservative. He's sort of supposed to be one of the grassroots leaders of the Trump movement. But his entire career is owed to the Israel lobby. His first speaking tours were originally funded by the David Horowitz Freedom Center, which is entirely funded by billionaire Zionists. Um, so he his he owes his career to to a lobby that supports an apartheid state five thousand miles away, and yet he's posing as America first and as a Christian. He's refused to condemn the assaults on Saint Por Porphyrius Church in Gaza, one of the oldest churches in the world, a fifth century Orthodox church. He's refused to condemn Israeli snipers killing women outside the Latin patriarch church in the Gaza Strip. He is basically a Christian front man for apartheid Israel, just like Michelle Bachman. Uh, this uh, is interesting. You mentioned I spoke about this with uh, a couple of my guests, the uh, the Christian Zionism, and it links back to this uh, Cyrus Schofield and this dispensationalism and con this um, Cyrus Schofield Bible, who was actually a con man. And then he went to jail, came out. So it seems like all, all of this for 1800 years, this wasn't even part of Christianity. So uh, this is something that it seems like people also have been duped into believing these fake uh, prophecies that they're trying to uh, fulfill. Do you, you, you know much? You know, obviously know much about this. Yeah, um, there's a, and I feel, I feel, I feel bad because I, I feel they've made it seem like, um, and if correct me, what, what do you think? I mean, it seems like uh, Christians who are seeing, you know, children just being blown to smithereens, massacred because they feel this is a part of their faith now that they're sinful if they go against this. But then when I bring on other Christians, senior Christians, and uh, from Allison Weir from Americans, if Americans only knew, if you've heard of uh, her. 
uh, they're saying this has nothing to do with Christianity. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a uniquely American form of commercial Commer Christianity. Commercial, oh. Um, you know, they, many of them believe in the prosperity gospel, that if you give money to the pastor, he will plant a seed in heaven uh, that will multiply and you yourself will become rich. And of course, you just become poor and the pastor uh, becomes extremely wealthy. Um, John Hagee is the most prominent Christian Zionist pastor in America. He pushes that mentality along with uh, faith healing. Mm -hmm. uh, people who go to his church believe that he can actually heal them of their, their sicknesses. Um, and they owe their lives to him. And then he tells them that the Jewish people have been blessed by God in order to fulfill biblical prophecy. And you have to see Jews in a sort of fetishistic way as a special people and defend them in everything they do. And Israel supposedly represents the Jewish people. And therefore, if you don't defend what Israel's doing in the Gaza Strip, where it's just massacring babies in this ungodly way, day after day, with no regard for human life, then you will not go, not only will you not go to heaven, you will not get what's owed to you after the rapture, uh, where, where all of the good Christians who've been born again will go up to heaven and experience unbelievable pleasure, while the people who've refused to submit will burn in an everlasting lake of fire, including many Jews, by the mm -hmm. way. And so what does John Hagee get out of that? John Hagee has been turned into an extremely politically powerful and wealthy figure by the Israel lobby, which set up his Christians United for Israel organization. I mean, he's been turned into a national figure that presidential candidates from the Republican Party must pay homage to uh, every time they run for office, including John McCain, who wasn't even religious. Um, APAC set up his entire organization. So once again, you have a Christian frontman for a foreign apartheid lobby uh, duping millions and millions of Americans into supporting genocide. Wow, this is um, deep. There's a lot to uh, package here. I mean, this is uh, incredible. I mean, for people, uh, you can see you're very well read and you're very well versed in many of these things. Just a few more questions before we conclude. This Hannibal Directive, you cover this extensively. Can you bring our audience up to speed? What is this directive? What is this Hannibal Directive? <laughs> Yeah, 
לא יודעים אם נפגעו חטופים בשלב שהתחיל ירי של מסקרים וכטמ"מים על הגדר כשראו את המסות שנכנסות ויוצאות. נורא לא, לקחני בלב על זה בכוונה, זאת אומרת אם הופעל אז הוא הופעל בכוונה, אם נפגעו חטופים במקרה זה משהו אחר. נורא לקחני בל כנראה הופעל באיזשהו שלב כי ברגע שהבינו שיש חטיפה אז הם מיד אומרים חבר'ה זה, זה חניבל. אבל חניבל שאנחנו התאמנו עליו כל ה-20 שנה האחרונות זה רכב שיודעים מאיזה נקודה בגדר הוא נכנס, מאיזה רכב, באיזה צד הוא נוסע, ואולי אפילו על איזה ציר הוא נע. פה זה היה חניבל המוני, זה היה המון המון פתחים בגדר, ואלפי אה, אנשים על כל סוגי כלי הרכב למיניהם, שהיו גם עם חטופים וגם בלי. זו הייתה משימה בלתי אפשרית לזהות ולעשות מה שעשו. אני יודע שמי שהיה לו חימוש ביד, כטמ"מים והמזכ"רים, עשו את כל מה שהם יכלו, בלי שליטה, בלי תיאום. ואנחנו פרוצים ליישוב, לוקחים תנופה עם הטנק, שובים את השער הצהוב. ומתחילים לדהור לכיוון ההכוונות עם, ה... עם הכוונות ידיים של אותו חייל, והוא מצביע לי אל טוב ואומר לי, תראי לשם פגז, יש שם מחבלים. אני שואלת אותו בחזרה, יש שם אזרחים? הוא אומר לי, לא יודע, תראי לשם פגז. אני מחליטה לא לראות שם לשם פגז, אנחנו מדברים על יישוב ישראלי. Well, just to put it really simply, the Hannibal Directive is a once-secret Israeli military policy in which the Israeli military kills Israeli soldiers or civilians when they're taken captive by Palestinians in order to prevent the kind of politically painful situation negotiations that we're seeing Israel forced to undergo now to get its captives out of the Gaza Strip, which means letting go Palestinian captives, political prisoners in Israeli prisons. And uh, we saw the Hannibal Directive employed on October 7th on a massive level when helicopters took aim at cars on the ground filled with Israelis, when tanks took aim at homes like the home in which uh, the Hetzroni twins, the Israeli Hetzroni twins, were being held captive. Uh, it was Mass Hannibal. First time, the Hannibal Directive came into play after the Jibril Agreement in 1986, which was a deal in which Israel swapped like, maybe as, uh, over, as many as, definitely 3,000, as many as 6,000 Palestinian prisoners for uh, just about three Israeli soldiers. who I think had been captured by the PFLPGC. It was, it was secret. And it came out that this was on the books in 2014 um, when, Israel, when a, an Israeli soldier named Colonel Hadar Golden was captured in the Gaza Strip during the Israeli assault on Gaza on August 1st, 2014. That was Black Friday for Palestinians in the city of Rafa because when he was captured there, Israel rained down tank shells, missiles they brought all force to bear in the area where he was captured in order not only to kill the team that took him but to kill Hadar Golden himself so that they wouldn't have to cut a deal for him and they killed over 100 Palestinian civilians in the process I was actually there a few days after I found just shells and missiles scattered everywhere marked made in the USA so that came out that you know Hadar Golden's family was upset with that. And it came out that they had this secret directive. And now we see it playing out in real time where you have um, over, I don't know how many people were freed in the last prisoner or captive swap, but like over 80 people. And they're all speaking. Some of them are speaking out or their families are speaking out. And what they're saying is at first we were afraid when we went into the Gaza Strip that Hamas were, was going to kill us. Then we saw that they were taking care of us. We were important collateral. And we were being bombed constantly by the Israeli Air Force, and we saw people dying all around us. And our biggest fear was that Israel would kill us, and then they would say Hamas did it. So in many ways, this is a kind of Hannibal directive, because you can see the Israeli leadership does not want to negotiate for these hostages. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do it, because it's going to require at least a two-week ceasefire. Um, and a two-week ceasefire could roll into something longer. 
um, if international pressure comes to bear. So the Hannibal Directive is something that is so central to everything we're seeing right now. Uh, and it goes to the core of the mentality of Zionism, which is a total disregard for human life, including the lives of their own citizens. So this uh, Hannibal Directive, meaning hostages never taken, even if it means killing your own people, is that correct? Yeah, it's named after the Carthaginian general who killed himself rather than be taken hostage by the enemy. And then we see, and then, uh, we see this is documented. You have evidence, uh, police investigation, Israeli police investigation confirms you had tanks, helicopters unloading uh, the belly. You had uh, friendly fire, indiscriminate firing. Uh, and this is from Israeli sources, the H-A-A-R-E-T-Z, Haritz, Haritz, Haritz. So these, this is confirmed. This is not any conspiracy. Based on Israeli sources that people on October 7th uh, who were said to have been killed by Hamas or, or other Palestinian militants were in fact killed by friendly fire, by Israeli forces firing indiscriminately at some of the areas that were targeted on October 7th. And for that, uh, you were called conspiracy theorists, including by Haaretz. But now an official Israeli police investigation in Israel has confirmed exactly what you reported, which is that an Israeli helicopter did hit Israeli, Israeli citizens on October 7th. An Israeli newspaper is reporting that an Israeli army helicopter may have fired on partygoers at the dance festival that was attacked by Hamas fighters on October the 7th. More than 360 people were killed at the festival in southern Israel. Haaretz is quoting an unnamed police source citing an investigation. Well, according to the paper, a combat helicopter arriving at the scene fired on Hamas fighters and apparently also hit some festival participants. So pretty extraordinary revelations, Hamda. Talk to us about this investigation that's being reported. An Israeli attack helicopter that was dispatched to shoot on Hamas fighters at the scene may have apparently killed some Israelis fleeing the area as well. And then you have um, testimonies from people like Yasmin Poret and others who are coming out and confirming the same thing that you also have uh, reported on. Yeah, I mean, Haaretz initially called me a conspiracy theorist from my article about October 7th that I published in late October. And now Haaretz is declaring in an op-ed that we need to talk about the friendly fire deaths on October 7th and the Hannibal Directive. Um, so they're acknowledging it. Israeli Channel 13 just did a documentary feature on Israeli tanks shelling Israeli homes on October 7th. <laughs> כדי לתאר לך את הסיטואציה, אתה יושב בקיבוץ בתוך מדינת ישראל, שאני מטייל שם בשבתות עם הילדים באופניים. אתה כל דקה יורד עליך טיל, כל דקה. ופתאום אתה רואה טיל ממסוק שיורה לתוך הקיבוץ. זאת אומרת, לא הבנתי. מסוק צהלי יורה לתוך קיבוץ ישראלי, ואז אתה רואה טנק נוסע ברחובות הקיבוץ, מצודד את התותח ויורה לפגז לתוך בית. זה דברים שאתה לא מצליח להבין, ואז פתאום אתה קולט בצד ימין מאות אנשים מהקיבוץ. באיזה שלב מאוד מהיר אמרנו, רגע, מישהו צריך להוציא את החבר'ה האלה מפה, כי זה לא הגיוני. כי נופלים טילים וכי יורים. אזור מלחמה. עכשיו, בסוף הם יצאו מהגיהנום הזה בתוך הקיבוץ, ומה, יחטפו טיל בכניסה לקיבוץ? כי, כי מה? כי מחכים למי? זה לא היה נראה לנו הגיוני בתור הורים לילדים. So it's all coming out now. Um, the problem is the Israeli government is doing everything it can to bury this reality because it will cost Netanyahu his mm. career for sure. And it will weaken the morale of Israeli society as they're starting to lose lots of soldiers in the Gaza Strip because their military operation is it's not going that well. And why do you think uh, journalists, other journalists like Piers Morgan, who we opened up the show with, why aren't they discussing these things, these important facts that people should know about them. Well, he's not a journalist. I mean, a journalist is, is someone who's just naturally skeptical mm. and they don't hold to one position. And they're not also, they're not, uh, they're, they're not controlled by fellow elites and elite opinion. Um, they don't need to, the journalist is supposed to exist on the margins 
and even accept social isolation. But Pierce Morgan, he likes to hang out with fellow wealthy people, including wealthy British Zionists, um, and he doesn't want to be castigated. So he's just sort of naturally pro-Israel because that's the mainstream position. And he's not someone who follows uh, the he's not someone who follows a skeptical tendency towards inconvenient facts and truths. Um, that's why you see him when he goes up against Dilly Hussein. He can't even believe someone is saying this to mm -hmm. him, even if it's true. He has to dismiss it as a conspiracy theory because he's never heard it before because he's not a real journalist. He's not that skeptical. Um, I mean, most of the people in our media class have succeeded precisely because they are not very intelligent. Uh, they're not critical thinkers and therefore they're useful tools for or, or useful stenographers for the powerful forces that are centered around the national security state. Pierce Morgan happens to be one of them. I mean, just the funny thing is he, he positions himself as someone who's open to all opinions and is willing to entertain controversial views. But He's actually a gatekeeper. Wow. So, and people can go and look at most of these uh, articles. Um, I went on the site, Gray Zone. It's called the Gray Zone. And you have, uh, for instance, you go on, I started reading and there's some, I think all journalists who are in the field. I mean, this is very important information you're bringing to light. Uh, a couple of them here are Scandal Stain Israeli Rescue Group Fuels October 7 Fabrications. That's one report there. You have Israeli tank gunner reveals orders to fire indiscriminately into kibbutz. That's a report. Israeli October 7 poster child was killed by Israeli tank. Eyew eyewitnesses reveal. All of this is at the gray zone, huh? It is. And, uh, no one's debunked a single thing no, we've wrote. No, no, no single, one has debunked a single thing that you've wrote. No, they haven't. Even, Haaretz tried and they called me a master manipulator. And then Haaretz wound up admitting to pretty much everything later on. Wow. Um, and no one will debate this. But if you read these articles, you will find everything that you're seeing, all the different examples, all the lies being, you'll, 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 you'll see it debunked and everything is sourced. Um, there are citations for everything. Um, and we also have a YouTube channel. Um, we do daily, we do weekly live streams, uh, me and my colleague, Aaron Mate, and we address all of this propaganda. Um, so we're going to be live streaming, uh, tomorrow. And we're also doing reporting from the ground in Gaza, working with local Gaza journalists. And I think that will provide you with a perspective that you're definitely not going to get in mainstream media. Um, when I get off this stream, I'm going to publish a piece about Israel's attack on the Nasser hospital in Khan Yunis, where it attacked a hospital with a tank shell and killed a 13 year old girl who had already been orphaned, had lost her parents and siblings and her leg. And then they killed her in her hospital bed. Where are you hearing this story in US media? We just, all we hear is about the October 7th hostages and we see constant interviews in US media with their families. We never hear about people like this, this young girl, Adia Abu, Dunya Abu Mosin, who was interviewed days before she was killed and said her dream was to be a doctor and get to get a prosthetic and walk and become a doctor so she could help other people like herself. And here is what Israel did with her dreams. Why? So we're doing everything we can to bring the other side of the story, which I think is much closer to reality, to you uh, with very little resources. And uh, it's all there at thegrayzone.com and, our, and our, on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Twitter at uh, the Gray Zone News. And we have an Instagram channel as well. Highly recommend everybody go check a uh, bunch of your workout. A couple more questions. Human shields. You often hear this just repeated over and over. How do you like to address that? Well, there's there, there's been no evidence of human shields as is understood in the traditional sense of a gunman actually operating deliberately behind civilians in order to gain cover in the Gaza Strip, except when the Israelis have done it on camera in Jabalia, taking men out of their homes, taking their shirts off and forcing them to march in front of them or strapping them with explosives and force, forcing them to go into tunnels ahead of them because they're too cowardly to face the Al Qassam fighters themselves. We have that on camera. U.S. media won't show it. Mm. Then we have just the whole concept of human shields that Israel's applying where, oh, a Hamas member. Meaning you basically like, it's like you belong to the 
conservative or labor party. You belong to Hamas's political party. So we're going to bomb your entire family and say that your family were human shields. Well, let's flip that on its head. Israeli soldiers are walking around in Israeli cities, going to amusement parks and beaches with their guns and their uniforms. So let's say Hamas had an air force. They'd be able to bomb the entire beach and pretty much every home and office building inside Israel if they applied Israel's genocidal logic of human shields. They pulled out. They pulled out in 2005, 2006. They left them. They could have made this into a vacation resort. They could have made it a paradise on earth. Right, right, right. Yeah, there was, there was going to be a, a Trump Tower in the Jabalia refugee camp if they had just <laughs> sat there and enjoyed their occupation and enjoyed being controlled by Israel forever. No, this whole like the, the, the U.S. and U.K. policy, I mean, U.K. policy is the U.S. policy. U.S. policy on Gaza is guided by a few basic racist principles, one of which is that Palestinians are just supposed to accept being controlled by Israel forever because Israel is the state that was granted to because of the Holocaust in the Bible. And Joe Biden accepts that logic. And therefore, October 7th was unacceptable, along with every form of resistance, including the Great March of Return, when Palestinians just basically tried to march to their lands that had been taken from them in Israel without weapons and were all sniped, shot, had their legs taken out from under them, were paralyzed, were killed. So no form of resistance is acceptable. They just need to accept Israeli control and the benevolent master will give them wealth and allow them to be a Singapore on the Mediterranean because that's just their, I mean, wh wh where's the, where's the pretext for that? Where has that ever happened before? Ladies and gem gentlemen, this is Max Blumenthal here with us, award winning journalist. Go to the gray zone, check them out. Max, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me on. I cannot leave without giving you a gift. If you're not yet Muslim and you're tuning in to see what these Muslims are talking about and you like a free copy of the Quran, go ahead and visit thedeanshow.com. We'll take care of the postage and everything and get it delivered to you. And if you still have some questions about Islam, call us at 1-800-662-4752. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.